morning. Welcome to Grace Community Church. As we begin worship this morning, I'm going to read what Paul says to the Colossians about the glorious Christ that we have the privilege of worshiping this morning. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. We come this morning to worship the one who is preeminent above all, and we are here only because he, by his blood, has made peace between us and God. So let's sing together to the glorious Christ. The radiance of the Father. The radiance of the Father. Before the dawn of time. You spoke in all creation came. Christ. You're seated now in heaven. 
foundation how firm a foundation you saints of the lord is laid for your faith in his excellent word what more can you say than to you he has said to you who for refuge to jesus has fear not fear not
As we were singing this song, I believe the Lord would want to encourage some of us here this morning, particularly those who are just in a season of suffering, sorrow, hardship. The scripture says, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things. I believe the Lord would encourage you, brother and sister, if you're suffering, He is for us. Who can be against us? Okay, folks. If we could get to our seats, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you all for praying for us this week. We had a great uh, elders retreat, got a lot done. Can't wait to share some of the things we feel like the Lord has given us uh, for the church going into the next year. Um, I'm also very grateful that the sound's back on, uh, not because I'm preaching, but, but because uh, we have a real treat here this morning. Uh, he's not a guest preacher. Uh, He's actually our worship leader, Justin, is going to preach the word this morning. Justin's been part of our eldership development group, um, and all these guys have been working hard and growing and learning how to, to teach and preach God's word. And so we felt um, we're going we're gonna to give Justin a shot up here, and I think you're going to really be surprised. He is very gifted, loves the, the word, and you're going to see that come, come through this morning. So... He's not a guest speaker, but let's welcome Justin coming up. Well, uh, I can assure you, I was talking with Tony this past week, uh, standing six feet away over there brings different nerves than standing <laughs> right here. Uh, this, this is much different, uh, rightfully so, uh, because this is an important part of our week. That's an important part of our meeting. It's, it's the most important part of our meeting as we get to dive in and hear from God's Word. So it's, it's a privilege uh, for me to be able to do this with people who I call friends um, and our church. So uh, thank you, Tony, for giving me the opportunity um, trying to make some of these nerves and emotions go down so that I can just start. All right. If you would uh, turn with me to the gospel according to Mark chapter 6. And uh, while you're turning, I want you to think with me for a moment about a time that you've been in a storm. And, and not just some rain, some wind, but, but a major storm. The, the one that the TV is telling you, you got to do something. Uh, the one where the radio is sending off alerts, 
telling you to take certain precautions. Go take shelter. Go buy food because we may lose electricity. You're going to need supplies. So a major storm. For some of you, uh, depending on where you grew up, um, that could have been a tornado. Uh, So I I can think of just the way that those things pop up. You don't have much time to prepare. You're told there's certain alerts that go off. You're told go find shelter because this is coming. For me, growing up in Florida, we dealt with hurricanes. So we had a little more time to prepare than a tornado, but even still, there wasn't much you could do. Uh, the, The news channel was telling you days in advance, here it comes, it's coming across the Gulf or it's coming across uh, the Atlantic, and there are things that you need to do to be safe. Board up your windows. In some instances, we were even told to leave town because this was going to be the one that took us out. So I'm sure as you start thinking about those things, and and particularly, like I said, growing up in Florida, there were times when we legitimately saw one coming. There's, There's an element of worry that starts creeping up. There's fear that starts creeping up because you don't know what's going to happen. It is completely out of your control. So for today, we get the privilege of peering into a day in the life of our Savior and get to see how His disciples react when they encounter a storm. Now, this is no ordinary day because what day could be ordinary when you are walking around on the earth with the Creator of the universe? For our disciples, though, they still do not quite get it. They obviously know Jesus is not like them as they've already seen him perform several miracles leading up to this day. But, as we'll see in our text, they don't fully grasp who he is. They don't yet realize who it is they're following and who is with them in the storm. Now, we'll be focusing our attention on verses 45 to 52. But before we dive into our text this morning, I think it would help us to understand our passage a little better to get just a short refresher on what happened leading up to our text. So we'll back up just a few verses to 34 to 44, and here we see a story that I think if you've been in church for any amount of time, you're probably familiar with, and that's the miracle of Jesus feeding the thousands with just a few loaves of bread and a couple fish. So here in this story, Jesus spends the afternoon teaching a crowd that has come to him. And as the day grows later, the disciples then ask Jesus to send the crowd away into the neighboring villages to get some food. Now, if you're like me, I think you can see what's happening. I don't know that they're so concerned about the people. I think they're more concerned about themselves because they're probably tired and they're probably hungry. And so they're like, hey, Jesus, why don't you send the crowd away to get some food so we can eat too? Now, uh, it's, it's interesting if you remember the story. Um, when the disciples asked Jesus to send the crowd away, what happens? He doesn't send them away. He turns to them and he says, why don't you provide them some food? And again, like most of us, They responded how we would. Uh, Well, uh, first of all, there's thousands of people here. I don't think we have enough money to go buy anything for them. And second of all, we've got five loaves of bread and a couple fish. I I, I don't know, Jesus. I'm not sure how this is going to work. So then Jesus proceeds to tell the crowd to sit down. He says a blessing over the food. He breaks the bread and fish into baskets and gives it to the disciples to give to the people. And then we read this, and they all ate and were satisfied, and they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. Now, this was not just a neat trick. This truly was an amazing miracle performed by our Savior, and it's, it's important we understand that as we get into our text, because certain things will come back as we start seeing what's happening with the disciples. So, with that as our, as our backdrop, we're going to dive in, and uh, would you read with me verses 45 to 52? Here's what it says. 
Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Would you pray with me? Lord, uh, we, we ask as we come, as we uh, look into your word, that you would help us this morning to see you more clearly, uh, as you have revealed yourself and are revealing yourself to the disciples. We are grateful that you have fully revealed yourself to us, and we ask that this morning you would continue to do that. You would continue to help us see our Savior, who is always near and who is always with us. In your name we pray. Amen. So to help us frame in our time this morning, here's how I would summarize our passage today. Our loving, sovereign Lord reveals himself in the storms of life. I'll read that again. Very simple but profound. Our loving, sovereign Lord reveals himself in the storms of life. Our Savior, the creator of the universe, the one who made the sea, The one who can, as we just heard, feed thousands with just a few loaves of bread. That Savior is the one who in the midst of our storm, in the midst of your storm, He sees us, He he draws near to us, and He comforts us. So those are going to be our three points of focus this morning. Our Savior sees, He draws near, and He comforts. First, our Savior sees. Now, the, the feeding of the 5,000 was an incredible, incredible miracle that obviously and rightfully so astounded the disciples. It also astounded the people in attendance, so much so that it causes Jesus to almost rush his disciples to the boat upon the collection of the baskets. Notice again Mark 6, 45. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat. You may be asking, like I did, what, what's, what's the rush? What's, what's going on here, Jesus? Well, Mark's gospel doesn't give us much detail on that. But if we look to John's gospel, we get a little extra insight on what is happening. Here's what it says in John 6, 14 and 15. When the people saw the sign that he had done, so just talking about the feeding of the thousands with a few loaves of bread, they said, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. So here's here's the issue. Jesus recognizes that the people want to make him king, but they want to do it for selfish reasons. It it tells us in our text, he perceives, he's able to see the heart. Seeing the miracle that he just did, the people see someone that can help them escape from being underneath Roman rule, someone who can help bring Israel back into its proper place. You see, this is a political desire for him to be king. This is not a desire for him to be the king or ruler of their spiritual lives. Jesus sees that, and he sees the disciples getting caught up. And so, Jesus 
in a way to help protect the hearts of the disciples, sends them to the boat. Get out of here. I don't want you getting caught up in this. Think of a a father who has young children in the room and something inappropriate comes on TV, something scary comes on TV. The father sends them out of the room or closes their eyes because he's protecting their hearts. He's guarding their hearts. That's That's what's happening here with Jesus. Jesus is guarding the hearts of his disciples because... This is not the reason he came. He didn't come to be their political king or ruler. He has his eyes set on something greater. Jesus has his eyes set on Calvary, the real reason his father sent him to earth. So, upon sending the disciples to the boat and dismissing the crowd, we see Jesus do something that we often see. And that is, he withdraws to pray. And I think this is, this is a wonderful, it's a great reminder for me, it should be a good reminder for us, that here we have God in the flesh, the Son of God on earth, yet still dependent on his heavenly Father. He still wants to have communion with him. As he has his eyes set on the future, he wants him to continue to help him now. This is helpful because we need our heavenly Father. We need to be looking to Him in those times. So here we get a reminder of Jesus doing exactly that. And we're not told exactly what Jesus goes and prays for. It's it's really short, just says He withdraws to the mountain to pray. But I think based on what happens next, we can make some assumptions on some of the things he's praying for. I think we can, we can see that he's praying for his disciples because he's fully aware of what's happening out on the boat. Look at verse 47 and 48. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he, Jesus, was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. Just a short note here, too. This isn't just a slight wind. Uh, Probably helpful to remember, these are fishermen. They know what they're doing in a boat. Um, So if they are struggling at sea, this is not like he put me out on the ocean. I'd have no clue what was going on. But in this case, these are men very familiar with this sea. And it tells us that they were struggling painfully. So obviously, if they had been rowing for hours and... Some texts even say they're maybe further from where they were trying to go than when they started. This was a severe wind. Can you imagine rowing for hours and going nowhere and just being in the same spot and yet exhausted? So Jesus is alone on the mountain praying and communing with his Father, but he has not lost sight of what's happening. His disciples are straining and struggling to move across the sea And he is fully aware of their pain and torment to row against this heavy wind. Friends, our Savior never loses sight of what's going on in our life. Just because, and this this is something that comes up, because we don't feel like he's near, it does not mean that he's forgotten us. Our Savior sees And he knows every detail of our life. He knows exactly what's going on right now. Uh, Another side note on this. Uh, I think it's important for us to recognize the Lord has put the disciples right where he wants them to be. Remember, he sent them to the boat. They're not there because they disobeyed. They're actually in this position because they obeyed God. And this is helpful because I I think often for us, uh, there are times when we encounter trouble, we encounter trials, the storms of this life, and we can think that we're being punished. We're thinking that, oh, we must have done something wrong. God is punishing me for what I've done. Now, don't hear me wrong. There are times we are sinful creatures. There are times we sin and there are consequences for our sin. But that is not what's happening here. The Lord sent the disciples to the boat And he had a purpose for them being right where he has them. And I think about, uh, as I was putting this together, just thinking of different trials, different storms that we encounter. 
Um, Christine and I have been married for 20 years. Actually, we just had our anniversary a couple months ago. And throughout those 20 years, inevitably, there's been a few trials. Um, never between us. Never. Um, but, but there's been trials. With it. There's things that happen. And, and one of the things that came, came to mind was most recent uh, from a couple years ago. Uh, if you've known us for any amount of time, uh, Carter had to have surgery on his spine. So here is... There's, this is not because of disobedience. This is a storm. This is a trial we are facing that is a major surgery that he has to have. So inevitably, as you're preparing, as you're going to the doctor, and they're telling you, here's what we're going to do, regardless of the confidence we had in the doctor, which we did, one of the best doctors we've ever seen, regardless of that confidence, there's still fear. There's still worry. And the, all of these emotions start creeping up as you think about what might happen. Even still, uh, the Lord was gracious and brought things to Christine's mind to bring to the doctor. Uh, there was something on uh, Carter's spine that, had they not fixed ahead of this surgery, could have paralyzed him if something went wrong. And so, that was by the grace of God, Jesus remem- uh, Christine remembered that from years past and said, hey, we might want to take a look at this if we're going to go in and do this surgery. They did, and a week ahead of time, I'm probably totally butchering this. Christine will be like, you, you messed that story up. Um, a week or so before, they're like panicking because they're like, wait, we can't do this surgery next week. We've got to fix this problem first. And we've, we're like, no, you can't move this. We have family coming in town. So you can see lots of fear, lots of worry, like, oh my gosh, what if this doesn't go right? The point is not the outcome. Okay, so Carter's here. Great news. The end of the story. The surgery went fine, but in the moment, all you can think about is what could go wrong. You have a child that's going into a major surgery to put a rod in his spine. There's lots of things that can go wrong, and so worry creeps in. And there's this quote that we've had uh, around our house for uh, quite a long time, And in the moment, um, on top of the prayers of the church, people visiting us, looking to God's Word, uh, praying to Him, this quote is also something that's that's helped us. Uh, Remember that Jesus has put us exactly where He wants us. It's a quote from Charles Spurgeon. It says this, Remember this, had any other condition been better for you than the one in which you are, divine love would have put you there. Friends, the the Lord does not waste any moment. He uses all things for our good and for His glory. And this brings us to our next point where we see Jesus then drawing near. So let's look back at verse 48. And He saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. Okay, so we have an interesting verse here. I'm sure most of you caught it if you were paying attention. It says, he meant to pass by them. So, let me get this straight. Jesus sees them struggling, straining against the wind, and he's just going to like walk on by, be like, sorry guys, (laughs) I don't know what's going on, Uh, hope you guys figure it out. That's not what's happening here, okay? So the English language can be tricky sometimes. So for some help with this phrase, he meant to pass by them, we can look to the Old Testament. Uh, where we see Moses speaking to God in Exodus 33. In verse 18, it says this, Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. Here, Moses wants to see God. He's pleading with him to show him his glory. And God's response is, I will make all my goodness pass before you. When God reveals himself 
to his creation, his glory passes by. It's on full display. And this is what's happening in our text. Jesus isn't passing by them as if to not be seen. He could have done that if he desired. No, here he is revealing himself as the God of the universe. He's going out on the water, walking on it as only he can do, the creator of the water, that he might pass by them. Jesus is doing this to show the disciples his glory. He's revealing who he is. And they don't just see the back of Jesus as Moses saw with God. No, for the disciples, they get to see Jesus in all his glory walking on the water. What a sight that must have been. However, the the disciples don't recognize him. It says, they think they see a ghost. So here we have some rugged fishermen with no category for what they're seeing here on the water. They're very familiar with the water, but they do not know what this is. They are in utter terror by what they're seeing. I think think this is what's happening. In their pain, in their fear, in their exhaustion from going nowhere against this storm, they're not thinking of Jesus. They're not remembering the Jesus who just two chapters earlier, probably sometime in the last year, quieted the storm on this same sea. They're not thinking of him. They're not remembering the one in which they asked, who is this that controls the wind and the waves? Instead, they're seeing ghosts. They've begun to worry. Their mind is thinking of the worst thing they could see. And I think if we are honest with ourselves, we'd realize we're prone to do the exact same thing in the midst of a trial, in the midst of the storms of our life. Maybe uh, you've just lost your job. You don't know how you're going to provide for your family. You've just tragically lost a family member and can't understand why God would allow that to happen. You're struggling again with the same illness that you've been struggling with for years and are simply exhausted. Maybe it's not something quite as serious. Possibly, like the disciples, you've obeyed God in something you believe He's called you to. It's just not going how you expected it to go. Regardless of what it is for you, the unfortunate truth about us is that when trouble strikes, often our first response is not to look to Christ. We don't see the one who previously brought us through past trials. We start to worry. We start to fear. We forget about the one who never leaves us or forsakes us. We start imagining the worst possible scenario. We begin to think of more reasons to be afraid instead of looking to our Savior for hope. If you take those thoughts a little bit further, this is what can happen. Our mind tells us we're never going to find a job like the one we had and we're probably going to lose everything. We start wondering how we're ever going to move on from the loss of our loved one. We see this most current physical setback as the one we're not going to recover from and possibly even begin to grow angry towards God for not healing us. Or we start wondering if God really cares about what's going on in our life. Uh, Something that uh, Christine and I heard years ago that has been a helpful reminder for us uh, in these types of situations, and it's something from Elizabeth Elliot, and that's that our God does not give grace to our imagination. That's because, as he reminds us in his word, he doesn't want us worrying about tomorrow. What good can come from thinking about what might happen? The good news is that His grace is sufficient for today. He's given us everything we need to encounter the storm right now. So, if this is you, 
and you're currently in the midst of a storm, I believe our Savior would want you to be reminded that He doesn't send you in to the storms of life alone. He is always with you. He will draw near to you to remind you that He is the one who redeemed you and ultimately will bring you through this current storm. The good news is that our Savior responds to us just like He responds to His disciples in this story, not with condemnation or anger for their lack of trust, but instead with loving and gentle compassion and abundant grace. And this leads to our final point uh, as we see Jesus' care and comfort for His disciples. Listen to how He responds to their fear. But immediately He spoke to them and said, Take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. And He got into the boat with them and the wind ceased. Now, two things to notice here. Notice what Jesus says first. Take heart, it is I. And with some help from R.C. Sproul, as I was reading through this text, I was reminded that this phrase, it is I, it's the same phrase that God used to reveal himself to Moses. In Exodus 3, this is what he says in Exodus 3, 14, I am who I am. And also the same phrase in the Greek that Jesus uses throughout the gospel to highlight his own deity. John 8, 58, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Here, God in the flesh is revealing himself to the disciples. And this identification of Jesus as God is reinforced by the fact that the Old Testament in Job speaks of Yahweh himself trampling on the waves of the sea, the very thing Jesus is doing here in Mark 6. You see, this is the real reason why he came to them. He came to reveal who he was. Take heart, it is I. Now, the second thing to notice is that the second part of what he says is supported by the first part, because I am God, because I hold the world in my hands, because I see all and control all, you have no reason to fear. Disciples, do not be afraid. You see, the do not be afraid has meaning because of who is saying it. Our God in the flesh is speaking to the disciples, do not be afraid, and you can trust me because of who I am. Jesus has come to them first and foremost to reveal who he is, and secondly, to calm their fears. Jesus multiplied the loaves for the purpose of revealing himself and building their faith in him. And while they were amazed at the miracle, they missed the purpose. The purpose was not amazement. The purpose was revelation. We see in our final verse of our text why the miracle of the loaves did not build their faith or understanding in who he really is. This is what it says. For they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Brothers and sisters, the Lord expected the disciples to grow in their faith and trust in Him because of what He had done, just like He now expects us to grow. He revealed Himself to them to help them see who He really was so that they would have faith in Him. And while the Lord had revealed himself to the disciples, he has even more so revealed himself to us. The place we see Jesus most clearly revealed is in the glorious gospel. Our Savior came to the disciples in, this, in their storm, but that was not the most important storm. He came to calm. No, as, as I said earlier, he had his eyes set on Calvary. 
where he would endure the storm of God's wrath and judgment for our sin. That is where we see our Savior most clearly revealed. On the cross, enduring the wrath of God for us so that we would not have to endure it ourselves. And this morning, if you have put your faith and trust in Him, you can trust Him in every season of your life because the greatest storm has already been calmed. That is good news for us this morning. We can trust our loving Savior. However, if if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, first of all, I'm grateful that you are here with us uh, this morning. Uh, But there is still bad news. If you have not put your faith and hope in Him, the storm of God's wrath must be justly poured out on sinners. Sinners that all of us were before He saved us. This is what Romans 6 says, the wages of sin is death. And that's not just a physical death, but a spiritual death eternally separated from God. But we have good news. The good news is that the verse does not stop there. Here's the rest of Romans 6. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you do not know Him, it is a free gift that He is offering. There's nothing you have to do but accept the gift. I plead with you this morning that if you do not know Him, that you would accept the gift of Jesus Christ. And if you'd like to talk more about what that means, uh, know that I would love to spend more time talking about what this amazing gift is that we have been given. And the pastors, there are many people in this church that would love to have a conversation with you if that is where you're at this morning. Please know that there is hope. In him. Now, for those of us who do know Jesus as their Savior, I ask you this Do you feel like you have been straining against the winds of this life, going nowhere fast, wondering if God sees what's happening, wondering if God cares, saying things like, I've been going to church, I've been praying, I've been living like you told me to, and yet I just continue to struggle. If that is you right now, I believe the Lord would want to remind you once again that your greatest need has already been met by the Lord of all. And secondly, I believe the Lord would want you to be reminded that regardless of the situation that you're in, He is with you in that storm. You can cry out to Him. He sees you, He knows what's going on, and He knows exactly what you need. It may not be right now. We want it now. We want an answer right now. The Lord, as we saw with the disciples, had a purpose. He didn't send them out on the boat and immediately go out to them. The disciples were in the boat, straining and struggling for a period of time before Jesus showed up. So, just like with the disciples, our God is near. He is with us. And you can completely rely on Him to provide everything that you need to encounter this current and present trial. So, as we close this morning. I'm looking at the clock. I feel like I went really fast. Uh, This is what I believe the Lord would want us to be reminded of. His words from this text, take heart, it is I. Do not fear. Let's pray. 
Lord, we, we are grateful that you, you have accomplished the most important thing that was needed for us. You have endured the wrath of God for our sins on the cross. I'm grateful this morning that we are able to come to you as, uh, as children who uh, have a loving Father who cares for them, who sees us in every situation that we are in. Help us, Lord, not to turn to fear, not to turn to worry, but instead to turn to you and to put our hope and our trust in you, to turn to your word, to turn to the people that you've given to us in this church for prayer and for help. We thank you that we are not in this storm alone. In your name we pray. Amen. Stand with us. God is sovereign. And he reveals himself. And because he has revealed himself to us as Savior, we can cling to him. We can run to him. We can trust him. We can keep our eyes on him. Father, I can come to you and boast of deeds I've done. My pride, I strive to earn the favor Christ has won. He alone pleads my acceptance, all my works. So I come with empty hands And I cling to Christ Father, I can go astray Than I 
my hope. But all my hope and peace is that you as Justin was preaching and reminded us of the connection with Moses, who was a, a foreshadow, a type of Christ. All that we read about Moses was pointing us to someone greater than Moses. Listen to Moses' last, among his last words of exhortation to the people of God before he was going to be taken up. He says, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. They're about to go into the land. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. And then he says, he will not leave you or forsake you. It is such amazing news and absolutely essential truth that we get that he will never leave us or forsake us. He is near. So... Let's go with that, but before we go, there may be some individuals here this morning that were feeling the Lord just speaking to your heart, reminding you, uh, maybe right now you're in the middle of something, and some of the questions toward the end that, that Justin gave uh, really touched you. He said, you know, have you felt like you've been struggling in whatever you're going through right now without making progress? Maybe, maybe you feel like you're during a trial uh, all alone. You don't sense the Lord's nearness. But as we heard, the Lord sees. He's near. And He is our comfort because He is always with us. So if, if that's you, we would love to pray with you this morning. So as we dismiss, uh, if you would like prayer, we'll, we'll stay as long as we need to to pray with any of you uh, that the Lord can help you to grab hold of this truth this morning and know and sense His nearness this morning. Amen. And Justin, thank you. Where did he go? Amen. You're dismissed. Have a great afternoon.